Well, I, I, do you know what? That worship was fantastic, wasn't it? Uh, I'll I tell you what I loved. I loved the sound of God's people singing. So it was great being led by musicians, but the voices, I think God in heaven was going, they're singing our song. <laughs> yeah, I think he was proper rocking that. That was great. Proper mint. Listen, uh, I was on the corridor in the office this week, and uh, Paul Watton says, uh, oh, we've got an international speaker this week. I said, what do you mean? I'm meant to be speaking. He says, well, you go on that many holidays. He says, I'm classing you as an international speaker. Shocking. I'm shocked. I tell you, shocked to the core. Unbelievable. I, I, I don't know about you. Do you find yourself with you? I'm going to get to God's word in a minute. But just on, on YouTube, do you find yourself, you come across the most obscure things and then you spend, you realise you spent an hour and a half watching stuff and you think, why did I watch? I was watching some videos about fainting Tennessee goats. I don't know if you've seen them. <laughs> These are goats who, if you go boom, boom, they fall over. Now, that, that is like all the muscles stiff. And they go, and they're actually, they do have to get excited as well because one of them jumped on a swing, got so excited, went, <laughs> fell over. And, and I was just thinking, it's this paralysis that hits them, that takes them out of the game. I mean, they do get up and they are okay and it's a genetic thing and all that. But, but you know, I, I, I began to think around, do you know the world we're living in with 24 hours a day, seven days a week, news media that reaches into every aspect of society, we just get bombarded with scare, fear, anxiety, and then there's always a graph to show you how this is going to affect you over the next six months. And that graph never gets good. It only gets worse. And, and you think, well, I'll go to social media to get a bit of respite. And, and then I find myself just looking at anger and bitterness and frustration. And, and people constantly show me the life, the great life that they're having that I'm not having and, and so you, you don't get any respite from all this when you go on social media. And, and then just the, the climate of culture we're living in today is, is if you want to have a certain opinions or certain views, you run the risk of losing your job. Some things that we've had over the years. So depending on what employment you're in, if you want to say that there is only male and female, you might no longer be employed. This is the world. This is the culture. This is the climate. We're living in. And I can understand why sometimes as Christians, we wake up and we look at the TV or we look at social media or we hear what's happening in the world and we go like one of them goats. Ooh, boom. <laughs> like, what's the point? What is the point? It's like it's a lost cause. That's what it can feel like. It's not what God thinks. Actually, when I was chatting with Beth Johnson uh, this week, and I was just talking a bit about what I wanted to talk about. And she said this, Rissy says, do you know what? We're called to be thermostats, not thermometers. Thermostats, not thermometers. We're not called just to take in the culture and be dictated by that. But actually, God's called us to be culture, climate, changes, yeah. right? That we can affect the change, yeah. not, not, as we'll see, not because of who we are, but who he is. Who he is, who God is, that's, that's our encouragement, that's our hope. And uh, this morning I want to, uh, do you know what, I'll start my clock. So I'll discount them five minutes or so. <laughs> my clock's counting now, right. Uh, thank you, man. Uh, I, I thought, do you know what, let's, let's drop into a similar situation that was had by the prophet Habakkuk. And it's with him we'll begin our journey of looking at how we move from being thermometers to thermostats. And, and, and a little bit of background about Habakkuk. Uh, so Habakkuk is, uh, in the, the Bible, if you don't know, is like lots of different writings. Some of them are letters. Some of them are like narratives of historical true events when God was moving throughout history. And some of them are what we call prophetic and then prophetic, uh, one aspect of them prophetic are called minor prophets. And minor prophets aren't minor prophets because they're under 16, okay? 
It's just that there's not many words in them books compared to the major prophets who were big ones. Okay, so Habakkuk is a minor prophet. And in truth, we don't know who he is. He wrote a book, but we don't know who he is. We don't know exactly what his role in life was at the time. Probably about 600 to 640 years before Jesus came to planet Earth. That's how we, and we do that through a bit of CSI type of stuff, you know, where, where you're getting into the scripture and you're looking for little evidence and, that, and, and you find out, okay, it says this, right. So we're probably talking about 600 to 640 years before Jesus. And a little bit of difference with Habakkuk is this. Habakkuk, often the prophets are God speaking through the prophet to the people. But actually, Habakkuk is a bit of a conversation with Habakkuk and God. And he's complaining about two things. One, he complains about the climate of the culture he's living in now. And then God gives him an answer. Then he complains about God's answer because none of us have ever done that. Uh, uh, but anyhow, so the thing is, you might think, well, okay, if he's 640 years before Jesus and Jesus was 2000, that's 2,600 years ago. What has a man got to say 2,600 years ago that's relevant to me today? Well, let me explain a few obvious things that we all probably understand. There's not that much stuff in life that's different. There's about six, seven, maybe eight things that actually creates chaos in the world. There's people want power. People are greedy. People are selfish. Sex gets in the way. Jealousy gets in the way. I'm struggling to think of too many other things. So when Habakkuk, 2,600 years ago, is talking about this stuff, it's actually the same stuff. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just slightly contextualized differently. So we can read what Habakkuk says and think, yeah, I can see that on our earth now, in my city, in my town, in my culture. And when we hear what God says, we can understand that actually that's true today as it was 2,600 years ago. So, uh, didn't have time to give you the PowerPoint, so you're just going to have to listen to the Word of God. Uh, or if you want to have a Bible or a, open that, it's going to be Habakkuk chapter 1. But listen, Holy Spirit, would you allow the words that we speak out of your word to actually land in our hearts and to shape our thinking and to build confidence in you in this day. Habakkuk, chapter one. The oracle of Habakkuk, the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see so much iniquity? And why do you, God, idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. This is Habakkuk complaining to God about the state of the nation that he was in. What would you say about the state of the nation that we live in now? Would you, would you have a few complaints? Because it's actually okay to tell God you're not happy about stuff and that you might not understand why it's happening. But you know what? Habakkuk is saying, God, the world's like this. Why? Why are you living with it? And God says this. Look among the nations and see and wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Listen, there is stuff that God is doing in planet Earth, in your life, in your community, around you that you don't even know. You don't even know. So it's not always based on what your experience is. It's based on what God is doing. And sometimes we don't know that. That's something to take hold of this morning and be confident God is doing things that you don't even know about. But he is doing some stuff you already do know about. So if I talk about the world I live in, which is different to each and one of everyone, I go around and I see a lot of stuff. And I've been a Christian since 1984. And I'm telling you this, I've never seen a move of God so powerful in the Northeast as I am seeing these days. Never. I never thought I'd see a day where on a Monday night in the centre of Millsborough, 
There could be 50 to 70 people gathering from all sorts of backgrounds, mixed up, shook up, drugged up, whatever the situation. They're coming and encountering and worshipping Jesus on a Monday night and their singing is like a roaring lion, like we've said this morning. On a Tuesday night in South Bank, a forgotten place for so many years, there's 50 to 70 people gathering, praising Jesus, being fed and prayed for and finding Christ every week. On a Thursday night in Stockton, there's 50 to 70 people gathered, hearing the gospel, encountering Jesus, being prayed for, being transformed. We have Eden teams set up all over the northeast, touching lives, engaging people with the gospel in the places where people said, it doesn't work there, but I'm telling you, it works there because the gospel works. It is relevant to every sphere, every culture, every community on planet Earth. God was not compartmentalised in his desire to reach people. He wanted to reach every single one of us. And that includes everyone in this room, even if you don't know Jesus this morning. Then God said, For behold, for behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. This is a problem for Habakkuk because these were bad people. Yet God was going to allow them to come. And, you know, he'd asked for God to intervene. God intervened. But his answer of how he was intervened, Habakkuk didn't like. And he then complained to God for numerous times about what God was doing. And God said, don't worry. I'm actually going to judge these people as well. Because God has a destination. And it was this in Habakkuk chapter 4. Verse 14, because God's view was this, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be filled. I went on holiday, well, shall we? I wasn't being international, it was Cornwall. They thought I was international because I was from Teesside. But anyhow, me and Anne went to Cornwall and we stood on the end of Cornwall, whatever that place would be. It wasn't quite Land's End, but it was Lizard. And I looked out to the sea, right? And I looked and, and I, I didn't know this. I did a little Google on this. It's 3,000 miles across that sea before you hit any land. And if you look to the right or look to the left, it's even further. And I just think, how amazing and vast is the sea that I can't even see the end. And God's promise is that and more is going to know the glory of the Lord. That's the day we're living in. Not the culture of defeat, but the culture of expansion. God is changing planet Earth. And we're going to discover that he's invited us to be a part of that, which is really good. Uh, I say that because I've just pressed the button and moved myself on. Right? So, let's, let me just read that. Think about that again. For the earth. That means every area of your life, my life, every job, every community, every sphere of society will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We got an insight into how God is going to bring this promise that Habakkuk tells us about there. And, it, and it, actually, some of the insight was given 100 years previously by the prophet Isaiah. And, uh, and that was Isaiah spoke into a time of fear and anxiety. And uh, in December, Mike Beaumont did a, a, a talk on Isaiah chapter 9. And who can remember this? Never fear. Oh, yeah. Can, can we have it again? Never fear. Never fear. If Mike watches this, I've got a bigger cheer and loud response than he did. <laughs> I win. And uh, so, never fear. God is here was, it was what Mike brought us. And uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 says this. Because this has given us insight how the glory of the Lord filling the earth is coming about. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness... On them a light has shined. 
Verse 6. For unto us a child is born. That, for those who don't know, is Jesus coming to planet Earth. Coming out of heaven, making himself human and coming on living and living on planet Earth. To us a son is given and the government shall be on his shoulders. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. For this time and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The increase of his government of peace will no end. When, when Jesus came to planet Earth, it was like a huge comet or meteorite but I can't pronounce that. Comet <laughs> lands in an ocean and sets out a tsunami of waves going out. So God comes into planet Earth and there's an increase of his government and peace going out after generation after generation. And it comes into 2022 and it's still moving and it's still moving. And in 2040, it'll be still moving. That's why the stars are moving out God spoke and they're moving out. The constantly creation is going to the ends of the universe. And 17, 700 years later, do you know what? I've got to stop. <laughs> I keep get excited and I top, touch this and it goes all over the place. Here we go. 700 years later, Jesus was born and he grew up understanding the challenges we faced. When he was 30, he spent three years ministering Telling people about the kingdom of God. Preaching, teaching, loving people. Engaging with people who normally were forgotten. And then after three years, he was crucified. And Martin wonderfully helped us as we broke bread this morning. And see what went on at that cross. That powerful moment. All those things that took place on the cross. And then three days later, he steps out of the grave and comes forth. He spends some time with his disciples and he gathers them together. And Acts chapter 1 verse 7 says this. As Jesus is talking to his disciples before he ascends to heaven. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and on all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That concentric circle of gospel, kingdom, influence, going out, changing the world, changing situations, began to be explore, exported. But this time, it was going to be through God's people. People like you and people like me. Normal people. Such was God's divine plan. God, the Holy Spirit, came on his disciples days later and has continued to do this in subsequent generations. Normal people empowered by God to change the world, to change the climate around them. 1901, there was a prime minister in the Netherlands called Abraham Kapoor. Right? Now, if there's any people from the Netherlands here, I apologise. That's probably not what he's called, but that's how I've pronounced his name. And he said this quote, I probably love this. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Mine. The enemy hasn't got a right on anything. It all belongs to Jesus. Every area of your life Every workplace you live in, every city you dwell in, every nation you visit, every whatever, <laughs> I ran out. It's all his. How great is that? And he is bringing in that kingdom through normal, everyday people, which is so fantastic. Listen, this is not how you do it, but this is how, oh, sorry, I spelled that. This is not how you do it, but this is how God does it, through normal people, people like us. You know, people who can't speak properly like me, right? He just takes us and he does amazing things. Listen to this little quote. This is a lady speaking. As a child, I learned from the Bible to trust in God and not be afraid. I felt the Lord would give me strength to endure whatever I had to face. And at 6 p.m. on Thursday, December the 1st, 
1955 in downtown Montgomery, Rosa Parks got on a bus and refused to vacate her seat. And a revolution began in America and beyond. A normal person who loves the Lord, who just knew that God had a moment for them to change the situation that everyone said was unchangeable. And she went and did that amazing thing. If you work with young people in church, and I'm thinking particularly youth here on a Friday night, who's heard of Edward Kimball? None of you. I hadn't until about a week ago. He was a church youth worker, and he worked with some young people in the 1840s. And uh, he had a particularly awkward bunch. None of that happens here at TVC. I was a mint. Right. But yeah, it did. Edward Kimball had, had an awkward bunch. And he used to pray for them and get really frustrated. Uh, and, um, but he just felt, God, God's got to change this. So this Edward Kimball went to this one particular guy, invested in him, and shared the gospel and led him to Jesus. That guy was Dwight L. Moody, who some of you might have heard. And Dwight L. Moody went on to be an amazing evangelist that traveled the globe. In fact, in the 1870s, he was in London preaching to 30,000 people in some meetings without any peer. Man alive, that must have been loud. If you were on the front row, you were getting blasted, that's for sure. Probably spat on like I am. <laughs> but you know what? Do you think Edward Kimball thought, I'm going to reach this lad and he's going to reach hundreds of thousands of people with the gospel? Or did he think, God really wants this lad to know him? That's all he thought. Do you know what I mean? All these people we engage with day in, day out in our lives, we just want people to know Jesus. And if Jesus uses it to do some uh, 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 extravagant things, that's up to Jesus. But the important thing for Edward Kimball was Dwight Moody found Jesus. The rest was history. There's a guy called Albert McMich... Mac <laughs> Anyhow, Albert... <laughs> Albert was a... <laughs> he was a dairy truck driver. And he, uh, he worked around a few of the farms in, in America and... Uh, he was a committed Christian, and, but he was an articulate. Or, 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 he, he just drove trucks, didn't he? And he, and he was nice to people. And, uh, and there was this mission going on in the, in the middle of nowhere. Well, it was obviously somewhere. But, but he's in, and he said, do you know what? Do you want to come? He said, this young lad, he said, do you want to come? Uh, you want to come and hear this fighting preacher? And he said, mm. He said, if you want to come, you can drive me dairy truck there. Well, that was the deal breaker. So the guy says, the young lad says, yeah, I'll come as long as I can drive your truck. That young lad was Billy Graham. For those who don't know, Billy Graham has preached the gospel around the globe and impacted probably more people than anyone else. 1984, Billy Graham came to Sunderland, preached the gospel and I give my life to Jesus and give a life to Jesus. Pete Conroy give his life to Jesus. Because somebody who can drive a truck offered to let them use his car, his truck, to get somebody to a meeting. A few hundred years, a hundred, well, what, 50 years later, 80 years later, I meet Jesus. Because somebody can change the climate and say, I can bring something to the table. It's called a dairy truck. And you can drive it, come to this meeting. This room is full of dairy trucks, figuratively speaking. Opportunities that one person can come to Jesus and what they do after that, it's not our call. God can do all sorts. Might be a Billy Graham. Might be a Fred Bloggs. Does it matter? Jesus is after that person and wants a relationship. That's the story. In one, the ones and the ones that become the twos. This room, full of car, climate changes. Where's Chris? Where you sat, Chris? You're there. Chris, he's a climate changer. Didn't have a job. Started volunteering at a community grocery in Ragworth. Loving people. Serving people. Helping out. But he's part of a team there that has meant some people have come to that grocery. 
found Jesus. He's changing somebody's climate by serving, by getting stuck in. Carlene Smith, are you in the room? She is, she's out there, over there. Carlene, I, do you know what? Every week you come here and Carlene and the people with her are welcoming you as you walk through that door. That's amazing to be welcomed somewhere, to serve, to make it a place that people feel valued when they walk in that door. Do you understand when some people in life have got themselves in a, in a situation where they're even thinking of ending their life and they might give God a go as a last resort and if they're not welcomed, they might walk away thinking even God doesn't like me. It's a powerful thing to serve and welcome people you're changing the atmosphere, giving up your time, coming in early. People like Carlene and the team there, fantastic. Of Warren Harrison, International Business School Dean at Teesside University. And you chat to Warren, his desire, his desire is to see Teesside industry transformed and for this to be a great place. He's working with people trying to affect that change that will bring jobs and and business into this area. He's training people from international nations who will be good news back to their nations. He's affecting a climate. He's changing something. The beautiful Anne Young. If you don't know, she's my wife. That's why I said that. Right. Anne Young. Young. Anne has a business, an internet business where she connects and and sells beautiful pottery that she's collected and moved on. That's one way of describing it. And I'm thinking, she set up a business that's moving stuff that annoys me out to someone else's house. <laughs> right? But nevertheless, it's a great business that she does. But Anne writes personal messages into all the products that she sends to people. She connects with people online. We were just chatting this morning that there's somebody in America she's chatting to whose son is struggling with addiction and Anne is just encouraging this person and giving her scriptures and praying for her and building a relationship with somebody at the other side of the world who's at a point of despair, changing the climate. Got Naz over there, future follower records. I've been in his house where he's been connecting with people from pretty nations all over the world. And he set up a, a record label to connect music with people who've got creative gifting and get it out into the world. And, but I've sat there and just heard him being a mate to the person on the end of the phone call or the FaceTime. And he's not shy, as you might know. So he does tell them about Jesus. He does bring change. But he's working there, affecting change around the globe. Stephen, Steve, Spensley, they're in the hospitality business. Their desire is to create spaces now that are a different sound, a different experience for people out there, changing a climate. I've got my mate Charlie Duffield. Are you at the back, Charlie? There he is. Charlie Duffy, he drives a tractor and trailer for scaffolders, right? He bangs in all the hours in the day doing that. Then on a, on a Tuesday, he gets in early. He, get, not get to, he finishes his shift. Yeah, don't get away early. He comes and he serves at the open well and he stands on the door and has the biggest smile ever to anybody walking through that door. He's creating an atmosphere. That's what Charlie does. We've got Tony Grange, Middlesbrough counsellor. Miracles do happen. <laughs> yes. But, but Tony's bringing a, bif, a different sound into the atmosphere of the council. Climate changing. So remember, of the increase of his government and rule, there will be no end. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The Holy Spirit has come to give you power to change the climate you find yourself in. You have been sent by God himself. And to finish with, there's a song I've been, I'm not going to sing it, just to clarify, okay. There's a song I've been listening to and I thought, you know what, the words of this song, I would love it to speak over us all this morning as we come to an end. So if you could do this, if you could just stand, if you wouldn't wouldn't mind, if you could. And I just want you to position your hearts to receive these words like they're from God. Okay, these truths about him. And actually to see yourself not as a thermometer, but as a thermostat changing the climate you're in. So I just want to read these over. So receive them in faith. To the mountains that we face, there's one name that's higher. To the empires of our age, there's one name that's greater. To the giants in our way, there's one name that's higher. And to the evil that prevails, there's one name that's greater. Jesus, you're the name above all names. Over our fears, over the storms, we proclaim that Jesus is Lord. To the burden of our shame, there's one name that's higher. To the battles that still rage, There's one name that's greater. To the doubts that steal our faith, there's one name that's higher. To the idols that enslave, there's one name that's greater. It's the miracle making, city wall shaking, prodigal chasing, Lazarus raising, destiny waking, history changing, the powerful name of God. So friends, in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all other names, lift your heads up and in boldness be climate changers because this gospel is good news. Spirit, break out.